Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Happy Aloha Friday and welcome to a brand new episode of Perspectives on Global Justice. This is your host, Beatrice Cantamo. On Latino Heritage Month, I could not think of a better person to interview today than Araceli Lopez Esparza. Um, and also, before we talk with her, uh, I wanted to bring attention to our viewers about um, our current climate um, in the United States with regards to Latinos in general and uh, refugees and people yeah. seeking asylum and uh, also this current administration that uh, portrays Latinos as a burden uh, and uh, a danger to our society and to American culture and that could not be farther from the truth. Uh, Latinos uh, make our culture, you know, richer, more resilient, and that uh, there is many contributions, you know, that we can account for in every single uh, field uh, in society. Uh, and uh, I think it's important that we bring this up uh, um, prior to our conversation as a, a reflection, you know, as we go through this program. So Araceli is a uh, poet and an educator and a writer and an entrepreneur. And uh, I uh, would like to welcome her into our program. Hi. Hello, Araceli. So nice to see you. Lovely seeing you as well. Aloha. Aloha. Well, so, Araceli, where are you based at uh, these days? Where are you living? Oh, where am I staying? Oh, yeah, Madison, Wisconsin. Madison, Wisconsin. It's yeah, it's a good, like, 50 degrees. Oh, my <laughs> dear. So, very different fall uh, from uh, <laughs> Hawaii. Uh, well, we are like in our mid 60s degrees. So, Araceli, um, I, uh, I, I, I know that uh, uh, you were not born and raised uh, in Wisconsin. Would you mind telling our viewers a little bit of your background? Uh, where were you raised and when did you immigrate to the United States? Um, actually, no, I was born and raised in Wisconsin. <laughs> Oops! Um, my, parents, yeah, my parents came over, like, um, they came over, like, when, in 1975, I think. Okay. But my, uh, my grandmother crossed when she was six months old. She was part of the um, 1940s Rosetta program. Uh -huh. And so all of these immigrants were utilized to, like, um, replace the workers that were left for World War II. So then all of these migrant people had come, and so we just have to come in uh, truly migratory, right? Mm -hmm. we, and for every other generation, we've come and gone to, from here to Mexico. So, I mean, yeah, in a way, I wasn't raised in for here, but yet in a way, I was. Mm -hmm. Because we, I often would go to Mexico, like, maybe sometimes up to twice a year. So I definitely have roots in both places. Both places. <laughs> I am so sorry for my oops, because I really, uh, I think part of what uh, uh, I remembered from the time we met back in Wisconsin, or about your Mexican uh, connection well, and roots. So you're from both places. I cross the border in every way. Yeah. I cross the border in every way except for like maybe, like, maybe through the river. I haven't done the river yet, but I have done it foot, taxi, bus, and airplane. So no worries. Yeah. Oh, no, that's all good. So Araceli, um, uh, tell our viewers a little bit uh, of your relationship with education. Uh, Okay, um, starting from uh, your background in school, and uh, why did you choose the field of education? And uh, what have you been doing with children and adults uh, regarding literacy and education? Yeah, um, well, I went to, as an undergrad, I went to Minnesota. So I have a lot of ties there as well uh, for my undergrad and then my, my graduate studies. It came about, honestly, I was just, um, I was in Mexico, uh, I saw this, like, thing flash over my email back then, you could, do, I don't know, it was, Google was doing that, and it showed me this program for, for graduate school about creative writing, and I had been knowing what that idea, because I found out on Facebook that there was um, a Chicano Latino 
a master's program, but in California. Anyways, long story short, I decided to go there to test it out because I'm like, it's kind of the hometown where I went to for my undergrad, so I might as well, and just see how it was. I wanted to write a comic book. Uh, for children, yeah, because like I've always been really attached to comic books. Love and Rockets, oh my gosh, yeah. <laughs> um, and I, just, I loved comic books, right? Um, anyway, so I was like, why not write that, you know? And so I went there for that mainly. That was my first idea. Mm-hmm. I go through the process of like mostly writing this book while I'm in graduate school, and I can't get to the end. And my professor tells me, Swati tells me, she's like, you better write yourself a picture book because I need to see the arc of a whole story. So I bust out a picture book, and it was very cathartic. It was just a lovely, lovely um, experience of having a story completed, um, having the container. So when you're, you know, in poetry, you have containers of, like, how you want something to be shaped. Where are you going to take this person in the story? Um water falling, uh, you know, it was very, very lyrical, magical, and just like um, having the chain of the story kind of made me think about just poetry in so many forms, right? As, as a free verse poet, you kind of are always apprehensive about uh, meter and stanzas and so forth, but then in graduate school, I at least found that love, but in the container of like children's literature. Right. So, um, yeah, so it really is about finding your, your rhythm, you know, your yeah. clave, your, and that's what one of my good teachers taught me about that, Meg Medina, about finding that rhythm, finding so your you, beat. You and, and so that's where I think I found my beat was um, writing picture books. Yeah. So you found your beat and uh you decided to share that um, with children, and I know you've written, uh, you know, poetry uh, for children. Yeah. So I want to ask you, because um, I, I was really enchanted uh, with the description of uh, the literary poetry for children, Latino mm-hmm. children, Latinx children, yeah. and uh, I would like for you to explain to our viewers what your uh, work with uh, poetry does and what are you trying to support uh, the children, Latinx children, as they read uh, uh, your poetry? So poetry and like comic books, any type of form like that that has this like container, this rhythm and like this stylizedness, right? And a poem and like, is a short, it may be longhand for what hip hop, hip hop era is too, right? You know, like spoken word definitely has its rhythm. Um, hip hop picture books have their rhythm as well, and that's the cross intersections of poetry, right? And just to value that rhythm, I think in children's books, so that children can see themselves. Their parents are like their parents. The street, the, the their neighborhood is like beating to a certain rhythm, and if we don't represent that, and that could be like samba, salsa, reggaeton, all of those, right? All those genres. If we don't represent them in the picture books, and the kids will always be dis- disassociated with like reading, right? Um, they won't want to do it. They won't want to read. Um, it was funny because uh, just like recently, I was in this like stealing circle regarding raci- racism, and my ex- I said it. I always wanted to be in a, in a fairy tale. How can I be in a fairy tale when there's like no representation? There's no brown Cinderella. There's no four foot abuelitas. You know, it's just like it's one it's one size fits all. No. My foot is too wide to fit in some girls little slippers, you know. I my people we, that's all we do is be on our feet, right? To think about being in a crystal shoe. And, and I don't know, right? The tropes, right? These cultural tropes that um get created through ch- children's books and it's at least Put us in there, you know? Right. At least put us in there in the right way. Yeah, well, no, yeah. and I think that that's really uh, on task and that's so necessary. You know, so many of us uh, Latinx do not have really princesses and, and models and uh, images to dream or aspire to. They look like us, they come from our background. And uh, and so this is definitely a way to make it a more inclusive and uh, uh, more equal, you know. And uh, and I think also it's a very special way to uh, broaden also older children's and adults' horizons. That you know there is so much richness and and curiosity. 
and things to learn about older mm -hmm. people and older cultures. So there's an exchange too, and uh, there is also a way that we can build appreciation and respect uh, and the more inquisitiveness, you know, of what we don't know and who we don't know and all of the assumptions that perhaps are being made that. You know, that can be reevaluated, you know, by a simple poem or, or books or theatre. And I think arts have such a special way of uh, doing that, you know, so it's really exciting. Yeah. Uh, Araceli, do you have a, a passage of one of your uh, poems for children that you would like to share with our viewers? You could read it or recite, uh, <laughs> if you have it. Um. I have something, I don't have that, um, but I do have a poem that I wrote, um, it was part of an anthology called Atravesado. Yes, we're going to talk and about that one soon, too, because <laughs> you oh, got a lot okay. of work to cover, <laughs> so one step at a time. <laughs> I'm covering the children literacy to build that foundation so we can transition straight to Atravesado. Okay. Uh, oh, okay. Um, I was going to say that poem actually is from the perspective of, of me being a child. Oh, okay. I will um, take that. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I was like, I take this one because I'm like, well, it's the intersectionality of like being a kid and it is the sort of thing, it is about children and I don't necessarily know if it's for children, but it's for the child that's inside of all of us, right? Uh, like, okay, so this one's called The Choices We Make. Um, um, so I was told you earlier how I traveled to Mexico many, many times. Right. So most of the time I was a translator and interpreter for my grandmother. And there's all these, when you're a child and you're going through these like culture shocks, it's almost like, yeah, like going to a predominantly white school. And that's like the, the ruralness or intersectionality of being a brown woman in a very 98% state that's white. It's right. very different when you don't see yourself, except for maybe twice a year. She said to me, the word is sacred. In the beginning, there was invisible, the verb. Her heart is pinned, not by needles, but by tight-faced letters. Purple rock crystals, I've seen you before as a child. I think she was with me. Was it in Mexico when they gave us that sheet of small crystals glued on? But exactly where? Guanajuato, San Juan de los Lagos, Irapuato? Dirt roads, stony, crumbling sidewalks, dusty, broken corners, laughing eyes, knowing I didn't belong. I moved back behind Abuelita. ¿Por qué me están viendo? I peep. Why are they looking at me? Someone says, ojo. Abuelita says, no creemos en eso. She says, we don't believe in that. So somebody said, I, like, giving me the black eye. So, bad eye. When... They are looking at me, I counter. No los vea, she, rem she remedies. But I'm looking for a small pieces of my face in their faces. Is this this where I belong? Her hair, I want hair like hers. His eyes, I wish they could be mine. Those hands I've seen before. I've stepped all where I've stepped. At the bottom, there was freshly covered snowland, perfect perfectly unconquered until I stepped again. And oh, so, that's yeah. powerful. Uh, and uh, what is the you. feedback you get uh, from uh, your readers as they uh, comment on that poem? Uh, do they see themselves in part of uh, your verses and proses? Uh, uh, what are the stories that evolve from, from, from this very poem? So, like, anything poetry is just like a... With a a little flight so it's just really me going through all of that experience of like looking at people that i wanted to become i wanted to embody what they look like right. or take some of what they had back with me and so i think a lot of children's books are about um the embodiment of a it could be like the police officer yeah you know there's always that cute picture book of police officers or like of um you know having pets and and all of that and so it, it's it's these um it's these interesting ways to like relive it, and so I think that um, most of the time when I, most of the time I don't think my audience are children so much as that they're the inner child of every adult, mm -hmm. right? Um, I, for the stories that I've written, which are a little bit longer than that poem, that's why they want to be out there tonight. Okay. But um, most of the time I try to, as we say, 
kill the parents, meaning I don't know the parents solve the situation. It's more creative when the kids are doing it. Um, we just, when the kids solve their own problems without any adults around and doing that. So in this situation, it was like I was solving my own problems, not feeling belonging there, but by encompassing other people's identities too. That's so cool. it makes you a chameleon a little bit, right? And so that's kind of, I think that's the thematic I would say about that poem, but certainly that's where my heart was when I wrote it, too, like just trying to put myself in a strange land. Okay. Well, I'm going to take a quick break, a minute break, and we'll be right back and talk about this chameleon okay. process, okay? <laughs> a little Thank bit you. more. Yes. Hello. My name is Stephanie Mock, and I'm one of three hosts of Think Tech Hawaii's Hawaii Food and Farmer series. Our other hosts are Matt Johnson and Pumai Weigert, and we talk to those who are in the fields and behind the scenes of our local food system. We talk to farmers, chefs, restaurateurs, and more to learn more about what goes into sustainable agriculture here in Hawaii. We are on at Thursdays at 4 p.m., and we hope we'll see you next time. Aloha. I'm Marcia Joyner inviting you to come visit with us on Cannabis Chronicles, a 10,000 year odyssey, where we explore and examine the plant that the muse has given us. And stay with us as we explore all the facets of this planet on Wednesdays at noon. Please join us, aloha. Welcome back to Perspectives on Global Justice Think Tech Hawaii. This is your host, Beatrice Contelmo, and uh, we are here today with Araceli Lopez Esparza. So, Araceli, we were talking about this chameleon aspect of you wanting to embody uh, more of the identity, the, the side uh, of uh, your Latinx culture and background. And so, please continue. <laughs> Well, I mean, I certainly have privilege to, you know, just for speaking English fairly well with a parrot, right? But out of necessity, it's <laughs> like you add to. And then, like a chameleon taking on those mannerisms, too, right? Because, like in school, you get teased, oh, you're acting white or whatever. And then compound that, that I'm not dark skinned. You know, I know what happens. A lot of my family members are can go very, very light, even with blonde hair, blue eyes, to really dark. Right, um, pero morenito, cafecito, right, and or like my kids, kind of a medium tan, but in the summertime they're red. They're red. <laughs> they're just red. Um, so yeah, I, I think there's there's that. You know, there's that too. There's all those variations of like identities. Um, one book in particular that sticks out to me is um, laughing, li laughing laguna, laughing laguanas in the snow. And it's written by Alacron, Francisco Alacron, who had passed away last year. And I love that juxtaposition, laughing iguanas in the snow. And these kids are going sledding down the snow. I'm like, those are my brown kids going down the snow. There's so many brown kids here. It was kind of that when they go down the snow, you're just like, wow, you know? Yeah. It just takes you back because you think, we are supposed, we're supposed to be forward as a movie. Yeah, <laughs> it's like that's, we're not that's supposed to be in this climate. And look at us taking over the snow uh -huh. and just having so much fun. Uh -huh. You know, and I think that the, those things, those images are really beautiful, those intersections, and that kids can encompass those intersections and they um, present them in, in a very unifying way. That's really beautiful. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when you walk with children in poetry and, uh, you know, uh, do you do that in schools? Do you do that in community centers? Where is your work primarily developed? Great, great. So I do have both work in schools. Um, I, can, I do like artist residencies in schools. We do a curriculum called um, bi uh, Portraits as Biographies. So we look at portraits, and then we reconstruct their, the biography of the sitter. So teaching them to be critical through visual art. Um, so that's a part of um, what I do as like is as a teaching artist. But also, yeah, I mean, I do we do uh, poetry in Spanish where we talk about how to code switch in a poem. You know, what kind of so as you saw in my poem, I code switch with the necessity of feeling to translate. Right, uh, there's spots about that too. Right, but it, you just I, at the same time I want you guys to experience it impactfully. But, it's 
it's hard. You know, it's really hard when you when you maneuver in between different cultures and different voices in your work. Um, so a lot of times, too, what we do, um, I talk to I talk to them about day of the dead. So we talk about sympathy and empathy through death. Right. That's a really huge problem for American children. Yeah. And so the United States children because they grew up not honoring that. No. And that's no. such an amazing. They don't talk about it. Yeah. They that's don't a, talk about that. That's such an amazing um, gift so, you're, you're providing, not only the one of exposure and that forum to be able to talk about it, but to exchange yeah. and to rethink yes. and to reimagine. You know, that's just like the best. Uh, uh, you know, gift that you can possibly, you know, exchange, uh, you know, in our community. I'm just so, you know, humbled and, and proud of you, you know, for, for doing this work. And uh, so I know that you have been doing a little bit of work, actually quite extensive work uh, with women in healing, and especially uh, dealing with issues of violence and trauma. And that, which brings to the older book that you also have written or, or contributed. So, do you like to talk a little bit about that? Yes. So, I've been doing Kurandera uh, praying circles. What does Kurandera mean? Much. So, for our viewers who no. do not speak Spanish or are bilingual. <laughs> Right, curandera means healer, healer creator writing circles. Um, coming from like the practices, so I was taught um, by our local Sham Shambhala uh, Buddhists about contemplative writing and contemplative arts and like meditation and mindfulness and so forth. So I incorporate that, but through very cultural specific lens. Um, and we talk about self healing um, as brown women and talk about our traditional. Um, Remedies, our indigenous, our indigenous um, idioms and life and funniness and all of that go together. <laughs> Throw it all together into like, yeah, you can imagine we're quite loud. <laughs> you think I'm the loud one now? <laughs> no, but you know, you know, sounds and being loud and let it all out is part of this process and. Uh, that is how we are, you know, and it shouldn't have to be suppressed. It is suppressed so much. I think part of living in the United States is that that, uh, you know, uh, unspoken rule of uh, having to internalize or, you know, speak always at tone lower or, you know, a little bit less. It's very direct thinking, you know, linear thinking, not circular like we are, you know. And so this is beautiful because it's totally cultural competent and sensitive, uh, you know, in the context of healing. It's very important. We need to have that, you know, that's the foundation. Oh, absolutely. And I think what, at least I always wanted it to have where it, it was completely decolonized, you know, and it's gone to this uh, conference in San Antonio with Gloria, the Gloria Saldua Conferencia, and they have it every year mm -hmm. in her honor. And I had attended this a Bruja, How to Do Your Own Bruja Decolonized class. And it was, I took it, it was amazing. I gave me so many ideas as a community activist and organizer where I could implement very, just like, I don't know, just free, more free flowing, right? Uh -huh. Just more free flowing ways right. to like incorporate our culture, incorporate these practices that oftentimes are like seen as for the for the bougie class, right? Yeah, They're like yeah. being kind of like you know just a certain manner look to it. So those practices sometimes seem even to people of color, they might be like, oh no, yeah, that's just like. Right. Yeah, is, I can't tell you how many times I've been in meetings of, I'm like, can we just do professional moves? I mean, <laughs> oh, I know. Uh, uh, we oh, have healers of all types, <laughs> and uh, this is, there is definitely a market for it and a need. So demand and supply. So there you go. That could be a, an expansion uh, of uh, your writing and your uh, uh, healing is the, that extension of services, too. This is great. Which... Uh, we are really approaching uh, the end of our program, but I would yes. like to not end uh, without talking about the entrepreneurial side of Araceli. So you you are the founder of Wisconsin Mujer, uh, which is uh, women, uh, Wisconsin Women, uh, for those who don't speak Spanish. And so tell us a little bit about the vision and the mission of Wisconsin Mujer. Um, our vision and mission is to 
So, and, and like give the stage to amplify and highlight marginalized voices mm -hmm. at all times. Even through like the way we do work. So we're not, not we are not a nonprofit, we are a for profit business because we want to help sustain ourselves and other women of color who are entrepreneurs mm -hmm. and um, the makers, the cooks, all of us, like we're just trying to work together and having like more of a marketplace um, for commerce that's like going right back to households that are sustaining our kids. That, you know, who are the home buyers? You know, who are the um, pretty much scraping, you know, class? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I think it's important that that's what my business does, is highlighting marginalized voices and giving, amplifying the, their um, platforms in any way, shape, or form through content creation and stuff. So people, I don't know, I guess I have an eye for color. <laughs> so I put things together. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's something I call, it's kind of like my knitting. I, I have to say that content creation is like my knitting, but it's also a fashion of like how I get my art into my writing. So uh -huh. um, it's been pairing nicely as of yet. <laughs> and so making it into a business was really like a leap of faith. And um, I can't say I'm here by myself with that at all. I had my I have great uh, support system in my family, especially my husband and my mother. And yeah. yeah. Yeah, oh, that's no, beautiful. It's, it's and so, uh, Dia de los Muertos is coming. So I hear that you're been working with a yeah. project on uh, through women uh, uh, through Wisconsin Mujer. So, what's that project like? What has that been like? Yeah. Oh, amazing! We're helping this um, high school. Our local high school is having a Day of the Dead um, fundraiser too on November tenth. Um, it's it's great, you know. People are taking off with this idea citywide, um, and I, I love it. I love it. Um, I, I, we've been, I've been slowly at this since, oh gosh, I think my daughter was like, I want to say she was like three or something. So she's like 10 now for seven years on and off. I've been in, in little ways, like talking about Day of the Dead, some way, shape, or form, either in classrooms and now in libraries, and now it seems like other agencies are having more buy-in. And I hope it's not a trend. It's like, especially right now with what's going on with DACA, with 3,000 families separated by their, you know, of their children, we can't, you know, we can't be going trick or treating with not knowing that all the kids there are not in the on our United States are not having a good Halloween either. Um, we all love the movie Kobo, but think about those Kobo kids. You know, those kids, um, mm -hmm. they're, they wouldn't, would they be free in this real world? Can you tell the, the view of the audience is that? So I think we need to really be truthful with ourselves as much as we are truthful to our own children. Right. Well, I can't believe that 30 minutes have elapsed already. I hope that you come back many times so that we can give continuity to this beautiful uh, chit chat we started today. So this was just a teaser. I want to thank our viewers for watching us and uh, uh, until next time, ahoy ho.